Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, hello from wherever you are joining us from, and welcome back to yet another Game for Thought live stream hosted right here at Hoest Digital Arts and Entertainment, commonly called DIE in Kortrijk, Belgium. Welcome back, and if you are a new viewer, if you are here for the very first time or catching it on YouTube later, welcome. My name is Ali Weiss. I am our ethics coordinator here at HOAS DIE, and I am very grateful to be hosting and moderating this Game for Thought stream here tonight. If you are new to Game for Thought, or if, you know, you just want a little refresher, awesome. This is the time where I explain the premise of the Game for Thought live stream. So we started with these, this live stream series about three years ago uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and it really came out of a, a want of students uh, to cover some of the less technically focused, but very ethically relevant, very societally meaningful themes that inevitably they would encounter and, and you know, industry professionals encounter on a regular basis. So we came to Twitch, uh, and since then, every month of the academic year, we tackle and discuss a different ethically relevant theme each month. And we give you all the opportunity to let your voices be heard in the chat. So as always, if you have any questions for our panelists this evening, go ahead and let us know right in the chat. You can ask any question that you have. Uh, just make sure to put a cue beforehand so we know it is a question for our panel. We're doing things a little bit differently this evening. So first of all, I am thrilled to announce that the theme for tonight's live stream is inclusive recruitment in digital entertainment. So definitely a crucial topic and one that hopefully all of you out there watching are interested in and can't wait to hear more about from industry professionals joining us from three different continents. You heard that correctly. The people on this stream are joining from three different continents. So we are thrilled to get this one started. We are going to do this one a little bit differently. So typically we start with a guest presentation and then jump into the panel discussion. We are jumping right into the panel discussion today. Um, and as, as you know, if you've joined previous streams, we typically never get through the question list that we have. So maybe tonight we will. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I'm thrilled to introduce our panel members for this evening. We have Jennifer Lufau. Jennifer is the founder of Af Afro Gamus in France. We also have Kira Chan. Kira is the chief of staff in at Netspeak Games over in the UK. Also joining us from the United States is Ola Gardner. Ola is a game design lecturer at Georgia State University, commonly called GSU. And last but not least, we have Aram Tawia. Aram is the co-founder and CEO of Leti Arts in Ghana. So as I said before, we're going to jump right into the panel discussion with these four. Uh, be sure if you have a question, put it in the chat, leave a cue beforehand. And we're going to take a very short pause here, get everyone together um, in the channel, and we will bring you the panel discussion in just a second. So again, very excited to bring you tonight's stream all about inclusive recruitment in digital entertainment. Welcome back to Game for Thought. We will be back with you in just a second.
All righty. We are joined with our panel members for this evening again talking about inclusive recruitment. So I briefly introduced our panelists for this evening just a couple minutes ago, uh, but I'd love to actually give it to our panelists and let them take it away. Um, panelists, if you could just tell a little bit about yourself, your background, um, and also why you feel inclined to join join the stream, uh, why you feel passionate about inclusive recruitment. So Jennifer, I see you first. So Jennifer, take it away. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, so I'm Jennifer, 30 years old here. I am based in Paris, and I am the founder of Afro Gameuse, which is a, a nonprofit. It's an organization, but also a community of about a bit more than 500 people who are committed in making the gaming industry more diverse. Um, so it's an organization that's been around for almost three years now, started during COVID, obviously. And uh, we're doing a lot of stuff to highlight more specifically Black women, but minorities in general in gaming, um, with a focus, you know, on esports, Twitch, seeing more Black women on Twitch, um, but also in the industry in general, you know, to become professionals as well. And I also work as a marketing consultant. So I used to work for Ubisoft until quite recently. Um, I used to handle the social media channels for the Paris studio. So it's the studio that makes games like Just Dance, Ghost Recon, or um, Mario Plus Rabbit Sparks of Hope, which has released not long ago. Um, and yeah, right now I work as a um, freelancer, so I'm going independent. And I want to do that work for gaming studios, more like indie games. Um, and I'm also trying to become a consultant, uh, more like a diversity consultant for studios also to kind of help them sometimes, you know, detect stereotypical, stereotypical um, facts about the characters or the histories that they choose for their gaming characters, because I think it is an important topic. And so I work in general towards a more inclusive environment in gaming. And obviously this panel was definitely um, interesting for me because I do have my own perspectives on how to make um, the, the industry more diverse, starting within the studios and how to recruit better, where to find the people, um, you know, the diverse people we're talking about. I'm just happy to be here and to share this uh, panel with everyone. That's me. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we are really grateful to have you here on Game for Thought. Can't wait to hear your thoughts later on this evening. Next up, I see Kira joining us from the UK. So we have Paris. Now we have the UK. Kira, go right ahead. Hi, I'm Kira. I'm Chief of Staff at NetSuite Games, which is a mobile game studio in the UK. Um, a bit of an unusual job title, but I basically work in the exec team um, and my sort of personal um, interest and my like, career background is in management. So that's like my area of interest and specialty. Um, NetSpeak has 50-50 um, men and women on our staff um, with two non-binary people on top. We've also got good representation of neurodiverse people, um, people of color, and LGBTQIA um, identifying people. So we're a small studio of around 50, um, but we still manage to, you know, have good inclusion. Um, and this is something that's really, really pers that I'm passionate about personally. Um, I'm also part of the UK, um, which is the one of the UK games industry bodies on their um, group for equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, so it's something that I'm super passionate about in the UK games industry. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kira, for joining us. Uh, 
as well. We can't wait to hear your thoughts during the stream. Uh, and we, this is the second stream in a row, actually, that we've had somebody from NetSpeak Games. Uh, so if you remember from the last stream about community management, uh, Lisa Schaefer joined us to, to talk about their experiences community managing at NetSpeak. So welcome back to NetSpeak Games and, uh, <laughs> and welcome, Kira. Thanks so much. Next up, Ola. Hello, joining us from Georgia. Hi, Georgia in the United States. For sure. Yes, Georgia <laughs> in the United States. State of peaches. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Ola Gardner. I am uh, super excited about this panel because I've been in education for over 16 years. And with me being on the side of training the new employees, I want to make sure that I um, enable them and help them understand what it will take to be a part of a successful team, whether that be you know, um, on a small indie team or a big studio, there are a lot of parts and pieces that go with this. Um, and so I try to get them to be as generic as possible and let the work speak with them and speak for them. And I know we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this panel is important because I've had experiences on both sides of the table. And so uh, I have to utilize those experiences to at some point try to mute some of the things that we see. Um, but I'm looking forward to having this chat. I think it's extremely important. Um, and I'm just excited. I've had my experiences too, Jennifer, online. So, you know, we get them everywhere. <laughs> so that is me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ola. Joining us from Georgia State University, uh, one of our newest partner schools here at HOEST. So thrilled to have you here, Ola. Thanks so much. And again, last but not least, joining us from Ghana, Aram. Hello. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my name is Aram, and uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Letty Arts, which is uh, one of Africa's full-time video game development companies. I think the first in Sub-Saharan Africa. We started way back in 2009. We have offices in Ghana and Kenya, and the whole goal was to kickstart this whole new gaming industry on the continent. And uh, because gaming is really nascent on the continent, over a billion people with the highest youthful population, and we not contributing to that pie uh, was really, really worrying. So our efforts has actually kickstarted a whole new industry, which is growing quite fast. So. Um, Letty Art has been in the forefront and with this topic it's really exciting because we started with a political journey of consciously preserving African culture and stories within video games in new formats which is exciting so it's all politics for us for at least the, the next 40 years we are going to put Africa everywhere in video games right so that um, that makes me kind of a politician and my numerous colleagues on the continent for inclusion in terms of diversity and it's also quite interesting where how starting a whole new industry from a continent you could realize that um, it's also um, an issue of gender balance right uh, um, ladies on the continent because we are struggling with both stem getting um, um, female to read even the technical courses and now games. So how do we bring them into this whole ecosystem? And um, I'm really excited to share some insights of how we are balancing the team. Um, though it's heavily dominated by men, we are having a whole lot of female also um, interested um, approaching it from the arts perspective and also the science perspective. So at Letty Arts, we are a team of um, now about 15 full timers and we work with a lot of contractors on on our video games as well. So yes, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. Wonderful. Awesome, Aram. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our first panel is from the continent of Africa. So we are thrilled to have you here uh, representing Letty Arts and Ghana and Kenya as well. Welcome. So we are going to jump right in now, shall we? Um, so the, the topic for this evening's live stream is inclusive recruitment. Um, I think naturally the first question that comes to mind uh, is actually, what does that mean? 
Um, so for you all in your experience, um, as you, you know, have, have navigated this professional environment, what do you think this actually entails? What is inclusivity in recruitment? Um, so I, I, I suppose that's the first question. Um, and a kind of a follow-up question to that is, how do we know if it's authentic? Um, how do we know if that inclusive recruitment, those inclusivity practices are authentic? So who'd ever like to uh, take the baton and start off the live stream? Go right ahead. Yes, Jennifer, hello. I can, I can start with this. So what comes to mind when we talk about inclusive recruitment for me is just making sure that basically people who do play games are also part of the people who do make games. Um, if I take the example of France, you know, we're a country where most roughly 47% of players are women. Um, and sadly, we cannot have like statistics um, about, you know, ethnicity uh, and more stuff like that because it's forbidden in France, which I think is a shame. You know, it has its good um, reasons, but also it's also some sort of, um, you know, it's, it's not, how could I say this? My English is bad today. I, I just mean to say that um, I think there's more we can do uh, regarding that. And so we have to consider that the people who now make games are based over the entire world, right? It's not, games are made to be played by people of all around the world. In that sense, I think it just makes sense to make sure that they are also included in, the, in the, the studios that are making the games. So I'm thinking obviously in terms of uh, people of color, people who have a disability, uh, gender minorities, the LGBTQIA plus community as well. And a lot more people who have the chance, you know, they're consumers of our games, so they should also be part in it. And the thing is that we are missing out, uh, from my perspective, on having actual great talent, actual uh, creative ideas that could really make our industry more rich. And if we're missing out on this, um, you know, it comes from our whole story. And there, there are a lot of reasons why the industry is not as inclusive as it should be. But we need to just kind of face what we have in front of us and try to broaden our horizons into, okay, we have these people who are making the games, but are they actually trying to create something that is going to speak to everyone? Um, are they making stories that will resemble the stories of actual people versus imaginary stories that, that we create so well, right? We already are so good at just uh, making up these beautiful imaginary, imaginary worlds. And I think where we lack is actually creating more authentic stories about uh, the, the, the reality of our society, right? And yeah, just in general, the people who do play our games also deserve to be part of the ones who are making them. That's that's what it makes me think of. Right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So so a lot of what I'm hearing is is looking at the consumer base, who is playing the games, and how can we allow them to be part of the teams making the games, but also is involved in the story. So it's kind of two a uh, two part um, response. Thank you so much. Anyone would like to add to that uh, inclusive recruitment? What does that mean? Uh, Kira, yeah. I see yeah, yeah, go right ahead. So I think it's important, first of all, to like talk about the difference between diversity and inclusion, because these are often used as synonyms and they're they're really not the same thing. Um, so you want diverse employees, you want diversity in thought, you want background, experience, neurodiversity, ethnicity, culture, gender. Um, there's like a Forbes study in 2017, I think, saying that you know, diverse teams are better performing, they make better decisions, and they're more profitable. Um, so having a diverse team makes just good business sense. Um, whereas inclusion is how you get there. Um, like, if your um, recruitment process is inclusive, it benefits everyone, like absolutely everyone. 
Um, and the to make it authentic, I think the you know the most important thing is you've got to have people believing in it. You've got to have people recognizing the benefit um, and are so committed to that from the very top. Um, and it makes my life a lot easier having the CEO very very committed to inclusion and diversity um, because then we can take a step back and identify what's not inclusive where the unconscious bias is and what needs to change right fabulous thank you so much Kira Ola I see you wanted to add something as well go right yeah. ahead Kira hit the nail on the head um here in the United States they use the word synonymously right and, and it's always a pair um when we look at the numbers here, women um, and minorities are like 20, 25% of the total gaming, film, entertainment, arts industry. And so that tells me just in the numbers that something is wrong and we may not be believing in it. So I think getting those trains of thoughts and understanding that I may come up with a solution that different from Jennifer, different from you know, Kira, but it's just the different trains of thoughts that agree to disagree, but I also want to come together and have a conversation as we're doing today. But I think the numbers can st continue to hold and they tell us we're not doing a good job. So. Again, uh, just as you say, Ola, that's <laughs> why I'm so excited to be having this conversation and also all of the Game for Thought streams. I'm thrilled that we're able to have these very open and honest discussions. Um, I think none of us 100% have the answers to these things, but the most important thing is that we are able to honestly talk about it with nuance. Um, so thanks for joining. Uh, Aram, any any uh, input with regards to your experience with Leti Arts, what inclusivity in, in recruitment means to you? Yes, yes uh, so for me, I'm really going to uh, take it from three, three steps. One is how to consciously include um, people of color and um, um, gender, uh, like the female gender, in our stories, and and that's the, at the virtual level. And then the next is the physical. What, how you we include um, more um, diversity in our teams that are building the games, and then at the esports level, how to also include more. Um, um, females in game playing. So here in Ghana, we have actually um, have associations that that tackle both. So at Leti Arts, for instance, we consciously try our best to put, um, um, to tell stories that are meaningful and authentic to the African, um, with the African historic and folkloric backgrounds. So um, also put disability in the line. So we actually have a character called Kamza, and Kamza was developed by a lady who also has cerebral palsy. So she actually created the character Kamza with cerebral palsy, and she may be the first ever superheroine with cerebral palsy that, that, uh, that is global, right? So definitely, Something like this is conscious, and we also did something with um, uh, Blind Ben Studios, Tenike, who has um, um, a game um, based on uh, people um, with albinism, right? And um, this character is Nuima, and they have their game Blind Frontiers, and we are making the comic for that. So, in terms of consciously putting um, characters uh, with diverse backgrounds in these video games and in exciting formats, Leti Art is very huge on it. When it comes to the skill set, look, um, here in Ghana and in Africa, I had already mentioned that um, female participation in um, video games is quite, the video game industry is quite low. And I can give an example. We were, we put out an advertisement to train ladies in gaming and the advertisement clearly stated games for women and we still had almost 90% men applying for a, like 
Wow. I'm at point that <laughs> states for women, right? So that shows you clearly. So I was asking ladies, you guys are <clears throat> probably shooting yourself in the foot. Why wouldn't you apply, right? And those who applied, we had to, um, those from computer science background, we had to um, make game development, break it down from a strength heightening approach. So the way we include people at Letty Arts is that we do a lot of internships. If you are a blogger, you come out as a game blogger. If you are a lawyer and you become an intern, you come out as a better game lawyer. So we try to heighten your strength, your existing strength, and still teach you the whole process that happens in the game de development ecosystem. Right? And the same we are also doing at the esports level with the Ghana Esports Association, where we have the female league who are consciously playing video games, um, 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 FIFA, um, eFootball, um, Frozen. Now we are consciously replacing some of these games that um, are well made by African games into the esports competitions. So we have a game called Sweep, which is made by Letty and Africa's Legends, which is now consciously being played by esports teams. And we have the ladies playing that game and the guys also playing. And the participation is increasing gradually. So currently at Letty Arts, we have about 20% um, female and the disability space is around. We have about three people with um, the, the disability also with us working in different forms, um, autism, cerebral palsy, and um, uh, yeah, I think they are different, I can recollect that. So we are trying to break it down for the society to know that, hey, you can do it, you can do it. Gaming accepts everyone. And when you come in, you can find your spot within the gaming industry. So that is how I'll define the recruitment bit. Um, of the question. Thank you so much, Aram. Um, and actually, I, I'm going to immediately segue from something that you just said uh, about so the advertisement that you sent out for for women in games in game development. And <laughs> you say that 90% of those applicants were actually indeed men. Um, so I, I do have a question that was pre-submitted, um, and it says so. Some studios, some say that studios can't afford to be picky as they sometimes have limited options in terms of recruitment. How can they navigate things given that they may not have a plethora of options to choose from? Uh, what if no women apply, for example? So actually that perfectly segues from what you just said. So given this mindset of, okay, studios can't afford to be picky. Um, you take what you can get. How do you respond to that and how can you navigate that within an organization uh, or a, a studio, um, even if you aren't in charge, for example, even if you aren't the, the, the CEO? Yes, and, and I think this is a definite problem across. And, and sometimes, as you said, we can't control it, but we can also make room and advocate internally for for studios to consciously pick women or the um, 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 yeah like the key population in no matter what so athletic arts we have a priority box not not to not to fail, um, favor people in terms of favoritism but in a way, there should be a balance. And I urge every organization to actually allocate a certain um, um, box or spot for certain key roles. So as I said, we make an application, a lot of men, 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 and then you get one lady. And at the interview, you can see there's this nervousness in even the lady who assumes that these are, like, there's an automatic intimidation. I don't know, probably, Jennifer, you can say more about it. Like, the ladies in the gaming space, 
feel that it's dominated already, so they might not make it. I think that is the mindset. Absolutely, whilst, yep. Whilst we recruiters also don't recruit, we don't recruit skill alone. We recruit people that, like personalities, right? We recruit personalities and people who have very creative mindsets. So currently I took in four female um, interns who are aspiring to be narrative writers. So they've, they've come in and they are working on three of our projects, creating very great narratives around different games that the existing team never thought of. Right, and they are finding their way in there. Yesterday, I had a presentation. One of them was like, "Oh, Aram, you should have made me speak to the speak to the crowd." Like she's built that confidence. She she now believes in her skill just because she can do a narrative for a video game. She sees herself as a game developer. So we have to have a way or a scheme to empower women, even during recruitment. Even if you are not going to hire the person. Let the person live with a certain um, fulfillment of being bold enough to try, right? So that is what I would put down, and I would invite others to also add to it. Yes, absolutely. I, I'm so glad that you've mentioned the... The, the the stereotype threat so the fear that for example that women or or people from minority backgrounds have immediately just from the get go of confirming a negative stereotype about their group and I, I'm glad that you say that. Also, I, I'm just curious, like Ola, if you have any insight because this also starts in education. So we see this. We're a digital entertainment um, university college. We see that stereotype already in stereotype threat in education already. So before they even enter the industry. Um, so I'm glad you bring that up. Uh, but if anyone else would like to speak on that, go right ahead. Would um, I am a, a game design instructor, animation, VR, AR, motion capture. I am the only one of me in my department. And so right there, you know, we, I'm surrounded by men. I don't mind it, <laughs> you know, but um, I now have the pressure of making sure that I'm the best example of a woman in this industry while still trying to maintain, you know, the curriculum. Um, there's just an, a, an added pressure that I have. I can't mess up. I have to be on point every day and it is exhausting and it's rewarding at the same time. I don't think that I ever felt scared to be the only one in the room. I've been to many conferences over these years and I've, you know, it's like being the only unicorn. I'm great with it because I have the conversation and I can talk to many different people you know, from different industries. It is however, very lonely. So I understand the women. I am also one of those people who I don't really like talking to crowds, but I find myself loving talking to the students because I have something to say and I hope they receive the message. But I understand where those four young ladies are coming from because it is easy to be intimidated from what you see in the room. However, because of what you see in the room, you have to say something and you have to, again, make sure that, you know, that you're the last thing that they hear. You're, you're, what you say has power and impact and not be just something silly that you said something just to say it, right? Um, I'm very purposeful about what I say when I say it, especially to my students, because I want them to practice with me. So I make sure that I, I call on my students and force them to get comfortable speaking, right? I, I think most of us gamers are pretty introverted. <laughs> I am, but it's a responsibility, right? Because I don't know if you have a question, I don't know if you have an additional thought about whatever we're discussing, whether it's a storyline or how to you know, approach a problem, I wanna hear from you. And I think that 
us trying to encourage them to talk more and engage more is just as important as providing the opportunity. So that's where it's important to me is making sure that they have opportunity to practice, 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 especially in the class. Because if we fail fast, they're in that safe space when they get out in the industry. It, it's it's not that big of a deal. So, you know, these days it's not that big of a deal, but I'm, I'm still very aware of what I need to do to be responsible to make sure that I'm providing a great experience and also a good example for the students. Thanks so much. And I, I actually have a follow up question for you, Ola. So you mentioned the um, it's it's somewhat fulfilling, but also exhausting at the same same time. So kind of a double edged sword there when it comes to the feeling of feeling like you can't mess up because you are the only one um, uh, of your kind in the environment. I wonder if if any of our viewers feel the same way. Maybe they're the only girl in their class um, or they they feel like the environment they're surrounded in isn't exactly inclusive or, you know, the, more, the most diverse. How do you deal with those feelings of exhaustion? I play a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's just I think answer. that is the best one-liner of this entire live stream series. <laughs> Listen, I've got my first person shooters. Those are my go-to. If I just need a break, you turn the system on, you do your, your, your session and you turn it off. And then I've got, you know, my favorite game is God of War and Ratchet and Clank. So I've got those things that really provide me some substance. But if I'm just having a day, I just put on Destiny or, or Call of Duty and, 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 and turn it off I'm, uh, and back on my day. I mean, you've got to find an outlet, right? Somehow I can't hold it in because my husband and my daughter they're right here. They're, they will be the ones on the front lines <laughs> for any attitude I might bring home, or maybe I'm not as loving as I need to be. So you take it to the game, you keep it there, and you let it go. Mm -hmm. So leaning into to what you feel passionate about, which is, is games. So again, in the same realm. Thanks so much, Ola. Um, so anyone else would like to add uh, or, or otherwise? I'll... Yes, Kira, go right ahead. Yeah. Like, so on the topic of like studios can't afford to be picky, this is something that makes me really, really angry. Yes, I um, saw Kira that you were shaking your head, yeah, 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 yeah. and I was like, Kira definitely wants to say something. <laughs> Go ahead. So, we do have a problem with like the applicant funnel. Um, there is a lack of representation. Um, I do outreach to schools because a lot of people from especially low income background they don't. You know, games doesn't feel like a viable career path to them. Like, we've got to go in, we've got to teach them that, you know, especially when you're spending so much money on education, that either you don't need the formal education, like there are other paths, or, you know, like this will or has the potential to pay off. It is a legitimate career. But that aside, like, I'm sure, like, Ola, like, you know, like, you, you have female students, you have students of color, you have like gay and lesbian students, like, you know, I think it's naive to say, oh, you know, we just don't have these people. And I get asked this all the time, like, oh, we put that out, like no one, we, we would love to hire more women, but they just don't apply. And it's like, well, what are you doing? Or what are you not doing that's putting them off? Um, you know, do you offer better than statutory family leave? If you do, is that on your website? Do you allow people, especially like parents um, or people with care responsibilities to work from home? Do you allow them to leave during the day to pick up their children? You know, is one of your perks that you, you celebrate like drinking beers in the office on a Friday? Like, who's that putting off? Like, are you excluding like Muslim people or people that don't drink? You know, do you if have this like nice employee photo where everyone looks the same? Um, do you have underrepresented groups in your game? You know, does it does it come across as a safe place for for an applicant? Is your branding like lean particularly masculine or feminine in a way that someone might feel like this isn't a home for them? Like, there's so many things to look at, and like we are a studio of 50 people, and um, we've just reached 50 people in the near three years I've been there. Um, we're pre-revenue. 
And like since I've been here, we've had four female programmers. So it's not that they're not out there. And bigger studios with like, you know, more resources and more money, there is absolutely no excuse. Rant over. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, and I think it, it really speaks to, to Netspeed Games and, and to your work also in, in general when you speak about that 50-50 gender split. Um, so, I mean, it is proof that this is possible. It's not something that cannot be achieved, um, but we just have to find ways to, to, to navigate it. Um, I... I do have another question, which uh, very in line with the other one, extremely interesting, might also uh, <laughs> might warrant some head shakes, but I will read it anyway. Excited to get into this one. Um, so it reads, inclusivity may imply to some that certain groups inevitably will actually be excluded. For example, some men, male applicants might be excluded if more female applicants are accepted. How should we look at this? Is inclusivity actually a double-edged sword that warrants exclusion? So this question speaks to, okay, if we are really putting in the efforts within our recruitment to have a, a more diverse team, for example, this just gives the, um, the example of gender. Uh, it could be many other things. But does that in turn exclude, for example, within this question, male applicants? Can, Can I, I say something to this? Um, yes. Yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, I mean, didn't we just have some sort of a counter example with what Aram told us earlier with their advertisement? Like, uh, he had a whole uh, job offer that says we're hiring women, and yet you have 90% of men actually applying. Um, I, can, I can relate to this in the sense that it's something that happens a lot in France as well. In France, we do have a study that says that um, men are 10 times more likely to apply to a job, even if they don't feel like they're, they don't check all of the boxes. When women, when we do see that we check only one or two of the boxes, if we only see like one box that we do not check, we tend to not apply. And there are plenty of reasons for that, right? It comes from education, it comes from how the we perceive the industry, so it just gets me back to what we were talking about, about studios being picky. And I feel like I, I also completely disagree with that. I feel like if studios are not managing to get more women, it's because they are not doing enough or they are not looking where they should look at. Um, for instance, we have... Um, in France, you have a lot of studios that hire people from, you know, mouth to mouth or ear to, to mouth <laughs> because they have somebody who knows somebody and then they will hire the person based on that. So I feel like that might not be the only way, right? We also hire a lot from like private schools, which are obviously also very expensive, private schools in gaming. When we do have a lot of universities in French, in France who that have, you know, much cheaper and more accessible education. So why not look into that? Why? Maybe it's up to recruiters to actually look at the different recruiting channels that are available to them and try to diversify them. So if you're only looking at the same thing all the time, obviously you're going to get the same people to join. That's how I feel about this. And moreover, you also have very good organizations and entities that are doing the job of, you know, showing you that there is diverse talent out there that minorities are already trying to get in, you know? So they're facing these obstacles and, you know, there is bias, obviously, there is gender discrimination, there is racial bias, um, a lot of things that come into the recruiting process that recruiters might not be aware of, but that still are true. So knowing that, uh, I do think it's up to studios to and recruiters, you know, to actually do the, the job of getting out there, also making sure that, you know, their job offer is actually inclusive. And if your job offer is inclusive, it's not going to repulse men from um, applying to the roles because men will apply in any case. And so I think it's in that sense that, you know, we, we should try and, and be better, just 
try and look beyond our noses and um, people will naturally get there and it will, will definitely also be more authentic because we're talking to a large scale of people. One other thing that I would like to add is about how, um, you know, if, for example, you're a recruiter and you have these two candidates that are absolutely great, one of them, you know, is typically the kind of person we would find in the game industry. So it would be, for example, a white cis-het male. Um, that person does have his change his chances of getting hired anywhere because he has a good background great education um that person is great but your other candidate might be a minority a portion of color or with a disability or from the lgbtqi plus community um so it's not about favorizing the second person it's about seeing and wondering if that person would get the same chances of being um, hired in another company. And so for me, it's a good way to actually check um, and, and kind of compare your profiles and make a decision. They still have both great skills. So you're not trying to like get someone and favorize, favoritize someone based on their, their, the fact that they're a minority. You're still looking at their skill sets and the fact that they come as the, at the very last step of the recruiting process says a lot. It's because they're great. However, how come they haven't found a job before when you do know that the person right, um, in, who is in the process as well, who is more, um, let's say, who has a more conventional or traditional profile with the industry will definitely get more chances to be hired anywhere. So that's one thing I would say, and that's something I usually tell also studios who uh, I talk to. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Anyone else want to want to add anything about um, inclusion uh, being exclusionary? Uh, the possibility of, of that. Ola, go right ahead. Yeah, I was I was thinking about what Jennifer just mentioned. Sometimes there's a box that needs to be checked within the studios that you did hire a few folks with DEI diversity and inclusion, and so. I know that I've found that it, I've been a part of that. Hey, we had to hire one person. That's been said to me before. And it doesn't feel good. I don't want to be anybody's token. So for me, I don't take that, right? I'll just have to eat more ramen for a little while longer. And then there's that after you've made it towards the end, like Jennifer said, you've got this thing where they say, do you fit the team? Uh, probably not. So how do we do this? How do we work this? So one of the things that I also uh, wanted to address is the quality of work. And so with so many women uh, that I have an area of influence with, I want all students to be at the same level so that they don't have to necessarily worry about this because it doesn't feel good inside when you have to, they're, they're, they're going to come across it no matter what. But just know that your work got you in, in the door for the first interview. Now, when you open your mouth, make sure that you are extremely, uh, you know, cordial and, and team driven and excited. It, and there's all of these other qualities that have to come along with it. But it feels like extra work, especially in light of what Jennifer just described. It's a lot of extra work just to make sure that you get the job and you fit. So I don't know how studios can get around providing more opportunity when they only have to check a box for a certain number. There's that, like this governmental thing that says you have to include it, everybody. If they didn't have to include it, what would happen is, is kind of the question that I have. A uh, little bit related to that, Ella, like I can only talk about the UK, but our laws here, you're not allowed to discriminate on um, the protected characteristics one of them is gender so if i had an applicant who was male who was ranked higher in the interview stage than a woman i would not be able to hire that woman over that man because that would be discrimination and illegal so there are sort of legal protections um but also like part of the first question like inclusion benefits everyone um and i feel it's it's bad faith to sort of be like well, if we accommodate you, am I being pushed out? That that's just not not the case. Um, and you know, like there's there's presumption that some of the things that I was speaking about before, like that only affects women or that only affects X group. 
but it doesn't like we've got our two founders have young children they frequently like make appearances in meetings like they take time to pick them up from daycare um and even for like white men who is the probably the highest represented group in the um games industry there's a lot of like intersectionality so you know even if you are a white man you might be neurodiverse you might be lgbtqia you might be um you know physically disabled there are all sorts of things where inclusion might affect you and it's in your benefit to you know embrace that yes and i think also to add to that also um for us here in Ghana and most parts of Africa, we are in this default mode of empowerment, you know, because the culture itself does not permit even women who get jobs in the video game industry. I've had fathers follow their daughters to come to my office to actually check on what sorry for my French, the hell is she doing in the gaming industry, right? <laughs> and you now need to educate the father or educate the mother that, hey, gaming can do this, can do that. So we've become preachers at the same time, hirers, you understand? So, so, so with, with us here, we don't even have or the industry has not gotten to, to the point to even have laws to discriminate within the gaming industry. We have to now educate parents that, hey, you can write game, uh, game designer as your title and still make a career because we don't, they don't see it as a career path here, right? And just yesterday, one of my friends who owns one of the biggest uh, esports companies, uh, here in Ghana came and was like, hey, um, one of the female players is having so much challenges with the parents, right? The, like the dad just doesn't understand that this girl, and this girl is a 17-time champion of Call of Duty Mobile, and she's playing competitively globally, and the parents just don't understand. And now we don't know whether to walk to that house or the dad and talk about it for you know so this these are the challenges that we recruiters here have to fight before even allowing uh, ladies to participate so for me i've created two streams i think one of the intelligent ways that myself and i think uh, my colleagues like malio games also has like we have training programs our companies are mostly like training programs right we need to empower people so i have associate internships and full-time internships then i have the employment so if you come for an interview and you know nothing about video games and you want to know about the industry i hire you as an associate intern you can do it online like just job shadow look at how things are going on our discord server join projects learn about the process and then we have the full-time intent that is if you have a skill and you want to contribute and we also do a, a lot of exchange programs so i get people from i was even just thinking of how howers can send in some female game designers to just come in and they will see like hey you are a game designer and then they will be yes <laughs> you know so so these are ways that we we are trying to set up the ecosystem to encourage more females into the space, right? So I would say that we also don't have the necessary funding to even accommodate everyone. So Africa is fighting a lot of stages, right? So we don't have the funding to be able to, to employ everyone. At the same time, you have to become this preacher man preaching to parents, preaching to people before they are able to come and work for you. So that is the challenge that we have here, right? So yeah, I think as we go on, we can definitely um, discuss further and see how to solve these things. 
Yes, thank you so much. And it's also, it's really incredibly interesting uh, to hear from each of you and all, and your unique experiences uh, within this domain. So for example, like the the stigma surrounding games uh, with parents, it might be very different, uh, for example, in Ghana than it is here in Belgium. So it's, it's really interesting to hear this um, and to, to open up a conversation about it. Um, moving on to the next question. So Kira mentioned earlier um, that it's really helpful when, and for example, Aram, I'm looking at you, you are, are the, the co-founder and CEO of Letty Arts. Um, and Kira mentioned that it is really important when the person in charge believes in this, believes in inclusive recruitment. Uh, my question for you all, looking towards solutions, um, a lot of the time these conversations are, are a lot uh, <laughs> problem focused, but looking towards solutions, um, what can you do if you are not, for example, the, the CEO, if you are not in a management position? Um, if you are, for example, an entry level uh, tech artist, uh, what can you do to promote the importance of inclusivity in, in recruitment practices? Um, I could say a few things about this. So for me, um, you know, I've been in this position myself, actually, so maybe I can speak from, from my own experience. Um, I think it's important to kind of like do two, three things. Um, first off, show them facts, right? If you have, for instance, uh, just a whole a picture of the whole team, right? Bring out the picture of the whole team, show it to your boss and tell them, okay, this is what our team looks like. So from what we see, and I say this because I also get to see a lot of uh, studios showing off their, 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 their teams on their social media or on the website. So as a person who wants to get within the industry, sometimes it can already be a barrier for me because I'm like, oh shit, there's no people that actually look like me in there. But okay, we'll see. Maybe they're great anyway, right? So show them the facts, the visual facts. That's like one first step for me. Second thing is to share how you feel about this. So how this make you feel, even if you don't necessarily believe you're not uh, part of a minority or you don't identify as one. I do think it's important like, to put yourself in other people's shoes um, and just try and convey how this makes you feel personally and how it would add, how it would benefit the company to actually be more diverse and to include more different people. There are now studies, there are now a lot of stuff to be done that can um, be used, right, to, to convince people. And I guess the third step for me would kind of be like to, uh, you know, come with solutions too. Come up with solutions, uh, at least stuff that can help. You know, there are a lot of organizations, like I said earlier, that are actually doing the job or maybe even find like uh, stuff from another studio and, you know, things that can help them identify where they could do better and seeing how other people, other studios are actually working towards this. Uh, some best practices, right, that can be offered to them. I feel like these are three steps that would be interesting and in general just explaining and showing them maybe even gather like see if you're the only one actually feeling like this maybe your teammates is also thinking the same thing but no one ever had the courage to actually come forward and talk about it so i feel like being open um about these this kind of topic is like the the minimum although it's it can be super hard i totally get that and i came with um in my own experience, I came to actually be more, much, much more open about this because my manager would also allow us to do so. So it also obviously comes from your management team to actually give you the space to be able to talk and to express yourself about these things. If you do have only at least one person that you can trust, that you can talk about this with, make the group a little bigger and then bring it up to the top. 
I feel like that would be a good way to to bring up the subject. Definitely. Thank you so much. Anyone else have have any insights or would like to share um, how to, yeah, how to find solutions? Ola, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to give an example of an experience and talk about how it took the top to make a decision. So I was recruited from an external from a studio recruiter. I had everything they needed on paper. Interviews were great. There was nothing face to face. So when I went to the company to interview, it was heavy security. I had to show my ID. They told me I wasn't the person that they interviewed. And so there's some CCTV. The president was watching. The manager who needed to hire was also watching. And finally, I, I just stopped talking. I'm like, listen, either they want what's in here or they don't. And before I could get my ID and, and drive away, they were like, come on, come on, come on, come on in, come on in. So I ended up speaking with the president. I didn't have to do anything, but it was the confidence to say, you know, either you do or you don't. Is it the knowledge or is it is this my barrier, right? So I went on in and I'll hurry up. <laughs> They they had a special thing. They made swag and printed for a bunch of different companies. They were making about four hundred thousand um, dollars over the year. Um, the person that I was supposed to be under, I ended up being over just because of my experience. And then within six months, they had made six million dollars because of the simple changes. I listened. And so being solution driven because I had a different way of approaching the problem they now have a different experience than understanding how that diversity, how it, including me, it, it, they didn't know me, I didn't know them. But right after that, I felt like my job was done and I left, right? Because I felt the whole time I didn't, I didn't belong, I wasn't included. However, I knew I'd be good at the job. So sometimes it does take an experience for upper management to even say, hey, let's give this person a shot. And I'm grateful I went through that because I can understand it now. I did get a chance to talk to that, that manager, that president, multiple times, and he just didn't know, right? He didn't, he didn't know. And if, it's, if you didn't know, then I can't fault you for that. But I, I was gracious enough to say, thank you for giving me the opportunity. You know what I mean? So I think within the studio, there's one thing, one type of recruitment. And uh, like you said, Jennifer, being able to have an opportunity to talk within, to express what you see. I, I do believe that showing those images is really important. And in the same breath, going back to just having the confidence to know you are the best at what you do, regardless of what anybody says. I felt strongly about that. And for me, it was their loss. I wasn't going to lose. I was going to go interview somewhere else, right? So having all of those I love things. love that for you. <laughs> it did. It worked out for them better than for me. But, you know, um, I just, you know, I, I think that it may take more experiences from the company perspective to understand what they need or how it could benefit them. So uh, I don't want any more experiences, let me say that. But, you know, <laughs> I, I just, that's my thoughts on it. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it, it's so meaningful that you had said something. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing that also um, on the stream. I think it says a lot from that single experience. Um, so you also mentioned, Ola, so you mentioned the fact that you, after you eventually joined the team, uh, you felt like you ultimately didn't 100% belong. Um, that was actually, a, it, it links very closely to a question that was submitted. Y'all are reading my mind uh, tonight. Uh, but there's a question that reads, recruiting people, um, so it's a quote, uh, recruiting people that don't feel like they belong doesn't get you anywhere. How do you respond to that statement? Um, so what is the consequent of importance of inclusive workplace practices? So basically looking at beyond the recruitment stage, how do you keep that continuity there? How do you recruit inclusively, but then, for lack of a better term, put your money where, where your mouth is? I'll start. Go right ahead. I didn't feel like I belonged because I was the only one that looked like me. So that's first of all. But to have the confidence to stay is a big deal because I don't give up. 
So color, I, I, I'm raising a mixed child. I don't get to, 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 to ha be, I have to be colorblind, right? Um, when it comes to the experience itself, I promise you, I left stronger than I went in. And so whatever problems people have, it's not my problem. And therefore I'm gonna trust in my skill set. I think that when it comes to the recruiters, and, and I feel like I'm a part of a recruiter on the educational side, right? Because we do interviews, we talk to them about art tests. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and, and, and how to be confident. You, you, you have to answer the questions before they ask the questions. Give them all of the answers. Start on paper, start with your work. I just don't know how to change people's minds about what it is that they need or they want. That's individual. I think as a collective, the company, and, and I'm so grateful to have Kyra here because it, if, if it is 50-50, that's amazing because I have not seen that unless it's an indie studio, right? So to be able to, to make sure that, that you are inclusive, the solution is to just try. Um, if that work, it, the money is where it is, first of all, for every company. If you're not making money, what are we doing? So if the art skill set, whatever that skill set is that you're looking for fits, it doesn't matter who's behind it. It's the brain that created it or produced that solution that should be first and foremost. That's coming from me being a part of that, having you know to deal with that. But again, I think it goes back to the individuals that make the collective, that make the studio. So how, the question for me is how do you change that to open up to even be willing to on some fronts? If, if I may, go right ahead, thank yeah. you, Ola. If I may add something, I, I was just about to say that most sh studies also show nowadays that, you know, um, um, players want to have a more diverse um, content. They want to find more diverse contents within gaming. And so for that to happen, the people that are concerned about this should be part of production. That's how I feel about it. And then to come back to um, the sentiment of belonging and how to make people actually stay within the industry. I have an, an, an anecdote about this because um, as part of the industry myself, you know, and as part of what I do with Afro Gameuse and, and the consulting and everything, I try as much as possible to encourage people to actually, you know, come in gaming, come work in gaming. It's going to be great. We need to take our space. We need to uh, suggest our own content. We need to make our own games, etc. And I do, I do believe in all of that. Um, and then on the other side, I do have women who have listened and who have applied and who have been hired. And a couple months later, they tell me that it was a total disaster for them. And this is where it actually breaks my heart because, you know, first of all, I feel guilty because I'm like, damn, I told them to go and now look at what's happening. Um, but I, I do have a friend who was hired by a big publisher. Um, she went there and actually, I think she was hired as part of a diversity quota. When she's somebody super brilliant, she wrote books about her specific expertise. Um, when she got hired, her manager uh, left. Uh, her manager, who was also a black woman, because she's a black woman, her manager had left for what reasons we don't know. She got hired and was not being used for her own expertise. She was being used doing basically secretary work. She was not being paid what she was promised and she was not given the opportunity to grow to actually do interesting stuff. She was being belittled in her job environment. And so knowing all of that, you know, when she told me about this, this has this had a huge impact on her self-confidence, on her self-worth and her own uh, being, her own mental um, state. And so, you know, what can you tell a person who goes through that? She had given up on the games industry after that experience. And I think it's tragic. And this is how bad things could get for somebody who doesn't actually belong uh, 
culturally uh, or in terms of you know many things within the studio because of maybe boys club, maybe because of harassment, maybe because of a lot of different stuff. It doesn't even have to go to harassment. It just has to go with does the person feel like she's being listened to? Does the person feel like she's being valued in her work environment? Does she feel like what she has to say actually matters and that her job, her role is being recognized? Does she feel empowered enough to speak her mind and to, um, you know, just grow as a person, but also as a professional in her own role? These are all things, and I'm sure there are a lot more of it. These are all things that contribute, right, to people's well-being. So you were talking earlier also, Kira, about how, um, you know, giving space to parents to go and take care of their children, maybe um, give them some time, you know, if they can, I don't know, have some time to arrive late from time to time, because it's just something that happens. These are all things that come within the inclusive part for me. It's not only about race, it's not only about gender or disability, it's about everything in general to me. And I really do believe it's a shame that things can get to, you know, that bad for someone to be like, okay, I don't want anything to do with gaming anymore. Right. Yes, and um, oh, okay, Kira. Yeah, well, Aram, no, Aram, no, go no, right you ahead. Aram, go right ahead, and then after you, Aram, then we'll head over to, to Kira. Yeah, so just to add to um, what Jennifer said, it's um, about care, right? Care to, to prolong um, um, sustainability, like to keep the person there. So, for instance, um, you convince people gaming is great, and then they go, and then they are... Um, ambition or something we hear we call vim, a slang here, you know, they are vim. So you, so you go with all that energy and then they kill it. So there's something in pigeon, your vim die, they kill your vim, right? And you don't ever want to work in the video game industry. And it's all about um, trying to pitch the game. So we are like, hey, gaming is great, go and do gaming. But there's a clear difference between playing a game and making the game. Making the game is not that fun as playing the game, right? So, so we need to have that clear expectation. And since we are in a, a world or a sector with an evangelism mindset for video games and to encourage people into the ecosystem, um, in Letty Arts, we have I have a structure that I put together called um, start teaching, start learning, start teaching. So, so you have entry level developers becoming managers over the next entry level developer. So nobody knows because I believe that once you are, I need to empower you to be able to manage the next person. Right, and make sure that you keep the psychological excitement of the next person, right? And I, as a CEO, I also come around to ask, is everything okay? Are you fine? Are you happy? You know, I check on that all the time. Are you happy? Is everything okay? Oh, you can come in. Hey, how was this? How was home? How is your this? You know, people have different personalities and with the spectrum of personalities that work in the gaming industry is even more difficult because a lot of people are introverts, some don't talk, you can't get into the minds of people. You know us, we are all very weird persons, right? So, so managing such personalities under a company is quite work as well. So you need to consciously know what to use to sustain people's energies to keep producing. And um, I know um, Kiro Games, uh, also from Cameroon, his wife is also part of him. And they, they balance their personalities very well because the wife is very outgoing, caring, and, and Olivia himself is, is 
like the big thinker always, you know. So they have this balance that the wife takes care of everyone and he focuses on the main business, right? So you need to have that consciously planned in your setup. Just like how Kira has the 50-50 policy, you have to be innovative about your surroundings and what would keep people within. It might not be only money. It might just be making sure that they know you care about them genuinely and then they will keep the company culture going on with you and working and still being happy. Everyone I've fired, I'm still happy. I'm still in touch with them. Everyone who has left me, I still keep, I still keep track. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? You know, and I'm genuinely happy for you, 100%. You know, so let's try and just make sure that friendship, business is, you know, defined clearly. And once you care about people, I'm sure they will gladly uh, stay and work with you. Thanks so much, Aram. Kira. Go right ahead. Yeah, so it's just sort of reflecting a bit on what Jennifer said. Like it really, like <laughs> at home and rang true to me. Um, so I've, I've, I'm sure l everyone here, or maybe lots of people in the audience, have had similar things where, you know, we we were talking about um, if your if the senior leadership doesn't support inclusion, what can you do? And there were loads of good ideas about what you can do uh, the the truth is it's exhausting and I've been in places where I'm just just butting my head against the wall like trying to convince people like you know there's a business case for this there's money reasons for this there's ethical reasons for this like you know listen to me <laughs> um, and unless there's that belief it's so hard to to get progress and I mean, like, you know, the fact that someone asked, you know, is inclusion, which I think everyone here agrees is a good thing, is that is that going to disadvantage people? Like the fact that that that's even in the sort of like consciousness of of someone to ask, you know, that's a very hard thing to fight against. And like, you know, anyone that watches this panel will have at least some interest or belief in inclusive um recruitment but how do we how do we touch on the people that don't the people that won't ever watch this that you know don't care about it um i'm not really sure where i'm going with this but um it, it hit a lot of sort of emotional threads with me yeah, that it but it also makes me think of uh of because we're talking about people in charge uh if if you're not on, on the top of the management totem pole, for example, how do you enact change or inspire change to happen? Um, I want to also dip into how do we, because in the first question we tackled what is inclusive recruitment, but I think now I want to ask how do we measure that? Um, do we measure it based on percentage only? Do we measure it on the types of positions people are in, whether, for example, people from minority groups are in are in management positions or, or lead positions uh, versus entry level positions. How do we actually effectively or can we measure that uh, that that diversity? So, like. I think a, a problem that a lot of studios have when they're really, um, you know, they, they've got good intentions. They, they see the benefit of inclusivity. They see the benefit of diversity. They want to hire more people. But you look at it and those underrepresented groups are disproportionately represented in junior positions. And you, you go higher up the company and it's, People are starting to look a lot more the same. Um, there's a thing in the UK about um, gender pay gap um, reporting, um, and that's only for companies 250 or more. But it's something that we do as an exercise, even though we don't need to report it to sort of keep an eye on things. And that is where you divide salaries 
um, into like four quartiles and then you check sort of the uh, gender ratio in each quartile. Um, and I also use that to look at sort of ethnicity um, and um, sexuality where employees have, you know, made that um, public because, you know, that's that's not something that, you know, I want to force employees to sort of reveal if they're not comfortable, but, you know, where I have that data. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really happy looking at the last time I did this. Um, we had in the upper quarter, we had six men and five women. Um, and we've got quite a lot of directors who are women. We are tech director, data director, production director, um, myself and the COO. We're in the exec team. Um, so we've got this. But what we've how we've achieved this is by taking a chance on people um, and not hiring them at that level, but instead letting them have that chance to shine and where they've sort of super impressed and shown initiative and shown those senior skills we've you know promoted them rather than you know length of surface or number of games shipped or triple a studio background so giving giving them the chance to grow really is is a major piece of of the success that you've had. All right, yeah, anyone definitely. else would like to share? Abram, go yeah. right ahead. Yes, um, so I think uh, for us, we measure it based on team compositions over time and also our product output. So when I say product, so we have frames of Africa's legends around the office. And when you enter, you can see man, 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 and then we are like, no, this should be replaced with a woman. So, you know, so we try to consciously also shuffle our legends around, you know, and artists tend to just start sketching men. And then we have to consciously shuffle them. So sometimes we can say, hey, this character has to be a woman. Make the character a woman, right? And we use that to judge how much inclusion we've been able to in, um, put within both product and within the company. And for team compositions, it's so hard to have probably 50% women currently as we have in Africa. So we try to put one or two women in every team. Right? And I hope it grows very quickly for us to recruit more women and have them run shows. Maybe what I'm going to try after this is to have a woman-only team and let me see what they are able to produce as well. <laughs> and and I love uh, that idea. Exactly. I think <laughs> that I'm going sounds to great. <laughs> yeah, immediately because I think I have a woman game designer who joined us. I have a programmer, lady programmer, and I have an artist who uh, so I'm going to put those together and see what they are able to do on their Friday brainstorming of their own projects. And let's see what comes up. I'll definitely inform you how that 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 works Yes, out. we will be anxiously <laughs> awaiting an update. <laughs> Please do inform us, Aram. I could, I could add something to this uh, in the sense that I think one way to also measure that is just by directly asking your team also how they feel so obviously the probably the the, the answers will uh, evolve depending on what kind of team it is right so if you have mainly people who look alike within your studio they might actually you know be kind of um, they might tell you the same things um, and but they might not also I, Honestly, I don't know. But I do think asking your team is a good way to, you know, asking them about how, how do they feel within the company? Do they feel like the company is being diverse? Do they feel included? Do they feel like they can do better in terms of inclusion? Uh, because I do think we underestimate how uh, people who work in gaming and also people who don't but would like to um, actually mostly want, you know, um, us to be more diverse in general. 
And the second thing I would add in regards to what you were saying earlier, Aaron, is about how the importance of having role models to set up role models, because we do know that they do have an impact on people and how they perceive themselves and project themselves within the industry. So if I'm applying to a company where I see in the big picture that, oh, they, they are people who look like me and not just one or two out of a hundred people, you know, um, if I feel like they're giving the voices voices to people who look like me also that they're making characters who look like me but also not just in terms of looking but you know sharing about their own stories um because i can definitely identify to someone who does not look like me however if i don't see someone who doesn't look like me i do feel like there's a lack i do feel like maybe i don't have a right to exist in this space that's how i feel about it and I want to also talk about how um, you were saying that earlier, Kira, how these DEI initiatives are definitely exhausting. And it's it's important to, I feel like some, some studios want things to get better, but they don't necessarily allow it to happen because they would rely on one single person to do the job and expect them to just change everything from up button to up and it's just a thing that we cannot change alone it's not just about recruiters or the teams it's also about the whole industry considering taking into consideration everyone it's an effort that has to be made by the government by the players the public space about associations, publishers, editors, and everyone to actually uh, make everybody feel more seen. That's how, I, that's what I believe. And clearly there's still like a lot to do, but you know, I also feel like you need to remain hopeful. Otherwise you just don't do anything. You just go to bed thinking it's, uh, it's going to stay like this forever. Yep. And yep. yeah, <laughs> we don't want to get yep. there. Yeah, we don't want to be there. We don't want to get there. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because actually we had a we had a stream about sustainability in digital entertainment as well. And Paula Esquadra, who uh, works at at Xbox, uh, she mentioned also that one of the key aspects in terms of of improving sustainability within games is hope. <laughs> that is, and it sounds so cliche. And it sounds, uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds silly even, but without hope, I don't think that it's possible to to inspire yourself and inspire others to make that change. Because I'm so glad that you said that, Jennifer, that one person hiring one person is not the the, the be all. And it's not the panacea for, for all of it. You know, it can't solve all the problems. One person is not enough. It's really a team effort. And with that, I I actually I'd love to move on to one of the audience questions. Um, so I see that the Lunicorn, hello, the uni the Lunicorn, uh, asks, how can we um, as an education attract a more diverse audience? So Ola, uh, given the fact that you yourself are are in education, Aram, given for example, we were just talking earlier today that, um, in Africa there is. There's really one uh, program uh, that we were talking about for game development specifically. Um, so when it comes to the origin of all of this, when it comes to education, how can we tangibly um, make steps to attract a more diverse student body? My mute did not want to unmute. <laughs> So it so finally it, did. It did. It did. So I have um, in the past um, traveled to K through 12 schools and, you know, given demos on VR and motion capture and gaming and talked to the younglings about instead of just being consumers and spending a lot of money, how can you be a, a, a creator? And so starting really, really young is a good thing. We, we have... Uh, turned Minecraft and Roblox into creation tools. Um, and then as we move forward, you know, we visit a lot of schools 
even Fortnite is doing some things to uh, bring education forward and gamifying. If that's where the, the younglings in their mindset are, then now we also have to bring with us and them, their parents, get them to understand it. So um, it's a lot of work, but it's so satisfying because if the parents understand and they understand it's not just, we're not just doing this, right? We're actually drawing and bringing STEM and STEAM into it. And even now on the college level, we're talking to the students about how, how the psychology of things work with games. Why do people play what they play? Why do they do what they do? Right. The math comes back in writing a, a sine cosine and making a wheel spin in animation. Um, all of that math is still when we use Unreal and we do the node-based blueprint coding, all of that is there. So we're bringing STEM and STEAM into it. It just happens that the output is a game. The output that you paid for as a consumer is a game. But if you start to show them what's on the backside of, of, of things, then I think that they would quickly see that a lot of, of what we're doing is reinforcing what they're learning in school. My daughter learned, she's nine, she learned how to do multiplication because I gamified just with those little multiplication cards. But she had a, a start and an end with a, with a goal, a reward, right? It could have been ice cream, whatever it was. But I didn't depend on her to go learn it herself. And I didn't have to make anything. I already had the, the multiplication cards. It's just in the way I presented it. So I think that we have to move with them and change it um, and be willing to go to the schools to talk to them. And I've done some work in, in communities as well, where we just partner up with a nonprofit and we provide Jack and Jill. I've just done something with Jack and Jill. I'm doing some things with United Way where they want to gamify their mission. So I think that if we meet folks where they are, then they will understand it. Uh, and I, I just know that they'll come because I love it. I mean, this is not work. It's a game. And it's so much fun to break something and then let that, I made this light bulb go off. That's what I, that's, that's what drives me on, on the educational side. Yeah, and it, it go, go right ahead, Abram, go right ahead. Yes, and I, yeah, I think that's really, really perfect. And um, it's really hard to, to do, but we need to do it. And as I said, um, here in Ghana and in most of Africa, gaming is new, education is also now growing. So uh, we only have some few universities who are offering gaming even at the level of masters and doctrine, like with University in South Africa and a few in North Africa and uh, currently Rubica started the ADMI campus in Nairobi and in the West African campus we have been spearheading with boot camps, uh, Malayo Games had game up um, in the Pan-African Gaming Group, we had a program called Makers Factory um, and a lot of different boot camps that we are spearheaded and you need to let people understand that gaming is a technical product all right but it's 80 percent a creative process so the steam you know i always say that even the word stem is stigmatizing the arts whilst you need the arts to be actively involved in STEM. So today you have women in STEM, this in STEM. Then automatically, in our universities, the social sciences and the arts are always having the majority of students, right? And you have the least having technical courses. So if you go and say that STEM, you are automatically cutting out 80% of potential STEM STEAM persons who could come into the STEM industry. So why don't we creatively use a game to onboard all artists into the technical discipline, right? So that is what we are doing, speaking to schools, having a boot camp, and, and, we, and as uh, Ole said, we use the anatomy of game design to teach computer science or to teach a technical product. So in game design, you can teach object-oriented programming better because you work with tangibles. If you have to shoot a bird on a tree, you are doing Pythagoras theorem, but in the game, you are just shooting a bird, right? And you, you learn the hypotenuse, the vector quantity, scalar quantity, all these things. You understand it better within a video game. So once 
you show the making of the game to the schools, they will now understand that, hey, this is something that I think we can adopt. So we, we um, I think, have started doing both esports. So the esports team, Association of Ghana, is trying to use esports to do the culture bit of game playing. So my kids are seven and eight years old, they are playing FIFA. And what I do is, if you want to play game, you need to play it well and win. If you don't win, I will whip you, you know. So, so if you play the game, play it well, right? Once you put that supervision on them, they themselves can say, okay, I will play the game once or, you know, come and tell me you won in Candy Crush or come and tell me you won in this game, right? And then you will now use the paper prototype to teach them how to build their own games. Then you take them to Scratch, then you take them to Unreal and, you know, Fortnite and all that. So we are working around, um, I think um, we have a program that I've just started called the Steam Academy. And um, we are trying to see how best to use Minecraft, Roblox. And um, there is also a company in the U.S. called America U who has the Heroes League. I don't know if Ole knows about that, that company. They actually license one of our characters, the, the Cerebral Palsy wow. character, in the Heroes League. So we want to see how to best use that Heroes League to champion you know, game programming here because of Kamza being part of the Heroes League, right? Teaching cultural diversity and all that within the Heroes League. So these are all success stories that we can use to grow the confidence level on the ground for people to know that, hey, gaming is the way to go. I'm talking to the government. Um, um, the National Film Authority also here in Ghana is now opening up to work with us with the film industry. How can we bring more storytellers to participate in the technical creative discipline we call video games. You know, that's how we are trying to brand it. By the time you make a game as a movie producer, you should understand game design. And one of the things I use is gaming is like a theater. It's like a theater director, right? Every entity has their roles, has their costume. They know when to come in. They know their voice lines. They know what to do. and the computer is or the controller is the director action 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 you know that sort of thing so there are a lot of ways we are trying to make it much more friendlier so that people can understand it so i think it's it's hard to do but we are working around it. and it would be good to collaborate on these things and see how best to heighten it on the continent definitely Thank you so much. And what you both have said, Aram and Ola, it perfectly ties back to what, what Jennifer said earlier um, when I asked about, yeah, how do we, uh, how do we, uh, the, bre the best practices for inclusive recruitment, how do we actually make this happen? And you said, Jennifer, um, if you are doing the same things, you will achieve the same results. Um, unless you try something else, you will achieve the same results over and over again. So with the teaching, with the boot camps and the workshop, with, with for example, the STEAM Academy, um, I think these are all really wonderful examples of doing something different um, and therefore achieving different results. Unfortunately, I look at the clock and I see we only have a couple minutes left. I told you in the beginning we almost never get through the question. So unfortunately, wah, 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 tonight is also a night in which we didn't get through all the questions. But that's okay. It's game for thought, you know. At least we, <laughs> at least we answered a few. Um, I do want to to ask the four of you. Um, I know this is a, a very broad question, but for the viewers out there, whether it's on Twitch right now, whether it's on YouTube later on, um, for, I, I guess this is uh, a two-way uh, question for the students, so young people thinking about getting into games um, in terms of this being an inclusive space. Uh, or in terms of belonging, what kind of advice can you give? And on the flip side, uh, for developers, for people in education, for managers, 
what advice can you give to them? Um, what are the practices that should be kept in mind? So on one hand, advice for students or our young people thinking about getting into the industry. I know, I mean, we have 1,400 students here at, at DIE uh, preparing themselves to, to enter the industry. Some very soon, some are already uh, doing their internships. Uh, so students and young professionals, and on the flip side, uh, organizations, studios, managers, people in charge. So in, in a very brief nutshell, final words. <laughs> okay, uh, probably I'll start. <clears throat> okay, so, so for students, I'll just say that if you really want to do games, start associating with the circles of those who make games. That's, that's one of the ways that you can identify your strengths and define a career path for yourself within that strength. So if you're an artist, I will urge you to concentrate on how to be a concept artist in video games, how to grow it and stick to your strengths. If you love journalism, stick to that strength, how to be a better journalist within the video game industry and associate and intern a lot and all that. It gives a lot of exposure and it works. With studio managers and look, um, keep, keep an open mind. Um, from now onwards, I will definitely um, entreat everyone to have a pool of like whether you be even Triple A Studios, create a pool for <clears throat> enthusiasts, people who really just want to know what goes on there. And you can actually hire from that pool when you create it instead of looking out all the time. So have some associations around your company so that people who really want to come into the space, you can have, you can create a whole pool that you can even be hiring from with diverse people, diverse skill sets that you empower. More outreach, more talks, have the empowering mind to, to, to encourage people to come into the gaming space because we definitely need them to grow. Thank you so very much, Aram. Thank you, thank you. Fabulous uh, final words there. Jennifer, go right ahead. Um, I'd like to add that uh, in terms of uh, of the sense of belonging, I would say um, just tell yourself that you always belong. If you set that up in your mind, it should, you know, it should help at least for you to actually go forward. Don't put yourself behind. Um, even if you feel like you don't necessarily have the skill set to apply for a role or anything, still just go for it. I do think that's one way of because it's also a way to for you to improve in you know your applications and do better every time. And don't let anyone tell you that you don't belong in the space or that you don't uh, you're not good enough or 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 anything. Um, I would say also to reach out to people. Uh, within the industry, like you said, Aram. And I do believe that networking in our in industry is super important. And it's what usually helps people uh, open doors. Um, so yeah, try and participate to several gatherings, gaming gatherings and events. Try and follow also people who are influenced or maybe who are not that influenced, but who are definitely inspiring in the sense that in the sense of their work and their expertise obviously but also in the sense of uh, the fact that maybe they look like you or they have a same the same background of you as you um i do know that it's something that helped me a lot because you know um, i did not really see a lot of people who look like me in the media and gaming especially in france and so i had to do that work on my own to actually find them i found one person who i'm still holding on to today and because of her, because I got to also talk to her and because she's so inspiring as a game developer, she also inspired me to actually become like speak up and use my own voice to actually try and change things. Um, and yeah, we're never alone in our own situation. There's always someone out there who's like thinking the same as we are or feeling the same. So I do think it's important to try and be surrounded by these people as well. Um, yeah, that, that's what I'm going to say. So we can be brief. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Really, thank you. 
Kira, go cool. ahead. So lots of great things on like networking already said. Um, unfortunately, a lot of like getting your foot in the door does come down to luck. And we talk a lot about like, how do we encourage like more diversity in like students? But another problem that the industry has is there's not enough junior positions for the amount of people that want to go into it. Um, but there's a degree of like confidence, like there's a huge problem, especially in women, especially in people of color, but in the games industry as a whole of um, imposter syndrome. So, so try and like fake it. Like I've had two of the best jobs I've had in the industry of when there hasn't actually been a job advertised. And I've just sent a cold email being like, hey, you should hire me. Um, and I, I'm someone who has a lot of anxiety, but like to just push myself to do that has worked out really well. Um, and we've talked a lot about like all the problems and like the bad side, but we make video games and that's fucking cool. Sorry for my language there. <laughs> <laughs> like, but it is it, it is you're it is. right Kira. it's really fun and you know it's great that we're just having these conversations because we can recognize that there's a problem that needs fixing and we are doing something to fix it and we shouldn't move away from the problems that we've got it's like excluding the great people that work in games and the fact that games can be such a fulfilling and enjoyable career Thank you so much, Kira. Really appreciate it. Really. And last but not least, one person left. Ola. Yes, please go right ahead. I'll be really, really quick. I wrote them down. Oh, so no worries. Manage your time. This is from the student side. Um, if you say you love it, love it. All parts and pieces, which includes the English, the math, the science, the physics. All of that comes back and is a part of what we do. Also, if you start, finish the drill. That's something we say here in Georgia, finish the drill. Um, there's nothing easy about what we do. So the art of discovery is a big deal here. Break it, go fix it. That is how you continue to be a master of your craft. I think that is key. For the companies, partner with us. You get to come into the classroom. It's a very safe space. Even if you're thinking about working on a project, I would love to partner with companies. I did it last semester, doing it this semester. It doesn't cost anything other than time, right? But it gives you a chance to work directly with the students and the students to work with you. And now you're already kind of thinking about, maybe I need to open up an internship for that person, that person, that person. But that's valuable feedback from my perspective on the educational side to continue to build the confidence um, and, and to get more into the industry uh, so that we can diversify. Keys to the kingdom from all four of us. I think we just gave it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just gave it away. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Jennifer, Kira, Ola, and Aram. It was an absolute pleasure to have you join us here tonight. Um, thank you so very much for your insights. Um, really invaluable and also uh, very diverse experiences and, and, and backgrounds from you all. Again, joining from, we're live from three different continents. So I think that is, that, that is super cool. Um, and thank you to all all of you out there who are watching and will watch this, um, I, we really hope that you keep these topics in mind. Um, yes, they are they are maybe less technical. Yes, you maybe d won't have these in the classroom. You won't talk about this in the classroom. Uh, but inevitably, um, there's a chance that you will encounter this uh, and, and topics like inclusive recruitment. So we hope that you that you keep this in mind. Once again, can we get some love in the chat for Jennifer, Kira, Ola, and Aram? Blow it away in the chat. Give them some love. Thank them so very much for your time. Uh, and I will be right back. So everybody watching on Twitch, hang on just for another minute or so. And stay tuned for some last information about, I'm going to say it, the final Game for Thought live stream of this academic year. I have no idea where the time went. Um, don't, don't even ask. I, I don't know. Uh, but hang on one more minute and we'll be right with you. Thank you so much for watching. Hang tight. Thank you.
hello, I hear Jennifer. Um, you can you can go to Stream Lobby. Okay, all good. Thank you so much for watching once again. All you out there on Twitch right now, um, and those of you joining us later on the interwebs via YouTube, thank you for watching. Um, thank you to Hoest and Ho Hoest uh, Digital Arts and Entertainment. And the colleagues who are supporting this initiative, uh, thanks, special thanks to the Flemish Audio Visual Fund for supporting us. Um, many, many, many uh, messages of appreciation there. Also, Casper, our technical whiz, who, yes, he's, uh, I hope you could hear him over there, who does all the things that that we need in order to be live on Twitch. Special thanks to Casper. Um, and again, of course, Jennifer, Kira, Aram, and Ola for joining us here tonight and sharing their invaluable insights. Make sure to join us. Mark it in your calendars already for the 17th of May, our last Game for Thought live stream. Uh, make sure to tune in via Twitch again at 8 p.m. CET. Uh, and stay tuned on both our Facebook page and our LinkedIn for further information uh, with regards to that stream. And also soon it will be time to gather the topic list for next year. And I really want to hear from you all about what you want to hear as part of the stream. We've done this since 2020. So this is the third season of Game for Thought that is almost coming to a close. And I really, we really want to hear from you all um, regarding what kinds of things you would like for us to come back and talk about next academic year. And with that, have a lovely evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you're joining us. Uh, and we will see you on 17th of May. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone.